I called out some promoter on Facebook on his really? on his status. Yeah, his status was I'm in the market for a new TV. What should I What should I be looking for? And I said, How about you pay my invoice from October instead? Talk about this on the podcast. <laughs> oh. Good. And now your local <laughs> forecast. Oh, hang on, start again. So the listeners, listeners, what happened? So someone on Facebook, a promoter, yeah, put so, up a status yeah. saying, "What TV should I buy?" No, nah, he said, "I'm in the market for a new TV. Who's got? What should I be looking for?" What did you say? I said, "How about you pay my invoice from October instead?" <laughs> These mics could be dropped. So we would drop them. Yeah, right. And do you know what he did? What did he do? Deleted his status. He didn't pay you. No. He responded to my message. Was like, yeah, next year, next week, I got you. How Fuck how long ago did you play this gig? October last year. It's, it's it's bad. Yeah, right. Well, that is the way to intro the forecast. Welcome back. My name is M4 Sonic. I'm joined by my co-host Chief Street, <laughs> and the topic of today is how do artists make money? Yeah, well, by finding good promoters that pay them is a start. Selling TVs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we wanted to talk about, you know, this is probably more for producers than our audiences, but. Uh, you know, it's good for you guys to know. How do artists make money? And there's so many different ways, but they're always changing. They're ever evolving. And it's just one of those really hard math equations that anybody starting out probably doesn't know. They probably think it's from streaming. Which is one of the worst ways probably. The other hard part about it is that, you know, there is so many avenues, but to understand, grasp them and be successful in, yeah. in them is much more difficult than just what we're going to do, which is just talk about it. Yeah. Well, my start... The first dollar I ever made was from YouTube. Congratulations. Yeah, I was, well, it was like 20 bucks. Hey, it counts, man. Yeah, it was awesome. So you had to have 100,000 subscribers back in the day. I don't know if it's changed now, but 100,000 subscribers before you could be monetized. Yeah, so then you got what, the license or whatever to be able to put ads. They, I think they so. would grant you the pleasure of having ads on your channel. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and that was great because I think that was a benchmark that was fairly attainable back then. And mm. then, yeah, once I was monetized, the, the money passively that I was making on the Launchpad videos was, I think by today's standards, not that much, but back then substantial. Mm. And enough for me to think about, well, I don't actually need to stock shelves at the local grocery store. Yeah. I just need to make more more videos. But I had a, hindsight's a bitch, but I, I my mindset was, the only reason people are subscribing is because I'm putting so much effort into my videos. Mm -hmm. So every four months I was uploading a video. Right. Man, if I had jumped on the... Weekly. Oh. Yeah. You were just Woo! pumping stuff out. It's yeah. a different culture back then though, so I don't blame you for having that different approach about it. You know, like you said, it's hindsight, I think. Yeah. And then the light show came about and I, I could see that, that that type of video could get pumped out much quicker. Uh, I could have jumped on that bandwagon and I, I chose not to. So that was my first income stream. And then the second one was, and that's what we've just talked about with promoters, it was live shows. Yeah. And that was cool as. Yeah, they're a good one. Yeah. So fun fact, the club shows pay more than the festival shows. All right. But you would think the festival shows would pay more because there's more attendees. Mm. But what, in my experience, not being the headline at the festival the headline acts would get. Yeah, they clean up. Yeah, they clean up. And then the other artists that have the, I want to say the privilege of, of playing on the main stage beforehand, they would get a lesser fee and in some cases no fee at all. Mm. And that's sort of like a, a bit of a secret behind closed doors. Yeah. Not everyone on the lineup is actually getting paid because sometimes the opportunity is actually more beneficial to the artist than to the yeah. the, the, the festival. Mm. So it's it's, you know, Occasionally, you'll just have a few a few people on the lineup. You're like, how did that person get booked? Mm. But you don't know. You don't know. So that's another another one. The, the one that you've been doing like recently and I've been doing too is recording other artists. Yeah, that's not one that's as simple for people to achieve. Either you've got to have a space, you've got to be, you know. Got to have a rep. Yeah, exactly. You've got to be skilled in, in doing that as well. Yeah. You can't. It's a bit of a daunting journey at the beginning, at least, trying to learn what it's like to work with other people and be successful at that too. When did you decide that you were going to work with other people? When I met you. Is that right? <laughs> uh, no, I really wanted to do it from early on. I, like the hip hop beat thing was yeah. always something in my head. Recording people probably wasn't at the top of the list, but I, I, 
I learned quickly that that was an avenue that I could achieve, especially having the facilities here mm. to fuel that. Um, it's, it gives me great enjoyment to being able to be a part of the whole picture rather than either just the beat or just the vocal. You know, being able to do both is the best. Yep. Yeah, it was difficult to begin with to trust yourself, to learn what it's like to work with other people in a creative space. It's not as simple as it is and everyone's different. So learning how people work and then learning the person as an individual as well is quite a skill. Yeah. I think what's fortunate for both of us is we're pretty chill people to get along with. Yeah. So I think that... We're also control freaks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. Well, it was right, guys. When we had um, Godlands here, we were just going through some stuff and I wanted to hear something like solo. I'm like, no, nah, solo that. No, not that one, that one. Yeah. No, do it like this. And then I was like, geez, I should probably just relax and take a step back. But that's just by nature sometimes. That's it. When you're in the right place, the right time, the right people. But it's just the passion, I think, coming through, yeah. really. It's just, you know, I recognize, like, I want to hear that. No, not that one, that one. Right. But uh, yeah, a bit controlling. I think at the time I was like, all right, I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Well, I found that I'm really direct in studio sessions. Yeah. And I know this is going a little off topic. We'll, no. we'll circle back to all well, It's the relevant to about. tonight. Anyway, we're about to have a session together. So Yeah, that's yeah. We're cool. working with a couple of artists tonight in the studio and I'm just going to sit in on the session just to make sure the gear works and to help out if I need to help out. I doubt I will. But okay. the, the, the thing with running a recording studio and steep learning curve for me, I never worked in a recording studio. I had hired recording studios before and they have a thing called runners, yeah, which is so cool. So you rock up to the session and the room's ready for you and you have one or two people that are like designated to your studio and they're there basically to help with anything you need. So you need to patch up something. So you want to route something through a compressor or you need mm. the, the big mixing board to be all set up because you've got a grand piano in the next room that you want to record or you know, they want to swap out a microphone, they do that, mm -hmm. which is awesome because things don't get broken when you have someone who is looking after the, the room. The other great thing though is that if you need a food run, like so you don't have to leave the session, they can go get you food. So not only are they like a technician as well, but they're a bit of an assistant. Yeah, so it's kind of, well, I mean, I haven't done this in a while, but the last studio session I did, they had a kitchen and they were making waffles and cookies. Where's our waffle maker? Yeah, we actually no, we do have one, and um, we've got a toasty machine too. Yeah, not bad. Well, could go some toasties Can't tonight. Just smash me ring all the time. Yeah, yeah, true. So that was really really cool, mm. and that was exciting to me because I felt like it was a team effort, and I, I like being a team player. I like, but I was like so nice to these guys too. I was like, I felt bad yeah. asking them to do stuff. We don't offer that yet here because we're a much much smaller enterprise. But I would like to think that we could get to a level where especially as we upgrade the gear and maybe you know, get bigger rooms and bigger projects, I would love to have someone that's there to help mic up a drum kit or something. Mm. But it just depends on the direction this place goes. And this studio is more going into a more of a media production studio than it is just a what you would deem a recording studio. Like I'm first to acknowledge that we don't have, you know, the, the massive SSL mix board, whatever, yeah. because I don't need to record 64 channels of audio. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember the first time I ever used one of those things and I plugged aux cable into it like it was such a waste. But you know, primarily we go for, we're vocal studio, I would say, which is, which is a massive market. There's so many artists that want to not record at home and want to record something, you know, on, on good mics. Or, the difference is tangible. Like you can hear, like the demos I get, from clients and then the, the end results. Yeah. It's like nine day. It's totally different. And it's not even to do with so much the gear, it's to do with the way the room's set up and how it's treated. And I really believe that too, honestly, because yeah. like sometimes the mics we swap out for certain clients and that, it's like they're the mics people have at home. Yeah. Well, like tonight we're recording on a Rode NT1A, which is like anyone can grab that off the shelf. It's the most robust microphone. Is it the best? No. Subjectively, I would say... The Neumann U87. The Neumann. Yeah, but like where those artists are at in their career to be recording on a $10,000 mic versus yeah. a $500 mic. And then, I don't know. It just depends on the project. I would love to offer certain individuals like better mics. Like we can put a Neumann in there if you want. Mm -hmm. Like well, the SM7B or whatever. Like again, we're getting like techie and gear heady. 
there's so many factors that contribute to the quality and it's got to start with the artist yep. and probably the environment. And then you could probably get a pretty decent vocal recording in that isolation chamber. I saw both from, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a, the Dragon Ball Z hyperbolic the, chamber. You were t- taking the oxygen out. You could you could use uh, headphones, Apple headphones, and record pretty decent demo in there. Yeah, yeah. It just it sounds great. It's a pretty dead space, and yeah. Anyway, we've gone off on a tangent. That's okay. Recording vocals is money. Uh, is, is money. Yeah, because it's. Yeah. I think yeah, like you said, it's tangible. People see the service. They come in. They they work away with their vocals, whatever, and then they've they've got that entry level into professional recording studios. The next level up from us, because we are primarily electronic, is to then go into analog recording, which is something I love. I love analog gear, mm. but I don't necessarily need to be recording analog like instruments. Or I've never had the pleasure of really playing around with a lot of analog stuff. It's pretty cool. Like yeah. when I do mix and mastering, I use some vintage gear. Yeah, that's and awesome. Like to think that it's actually having an electrical current. And also the amount of power I'm getting out of it is nuts. Yeah. And there is a characteristic to it. So certain compressors and limiters have like a dither, mm-hmm. which is something that you can't hear. I'd love to show you. Test me. Yeah, like yeah. show you what, and it's just, ah. But also I don't, I don't pretend to know like I know what I'm talking about. It's, it's something that I'm still learning the craft of and mm. I love experimenting and, and I've been blessed to have lots of mix and mastering clients that like my... I don't know, the way that I mix and master their records and yeah, ultimately I'm just adding a shit ton of power to it and balancing it and listening to it in my room, which that's another thing too. We're, we're going to talk about in this episode, not so much just how, how you make money, but ways in which not to spend money when you're starting out in this game. Mm. I've got a set of speakers that anyone can buy. Yeah. They're super affordable, but I've been using that type of speaker now for I think 14 years, maybe longer. But the reason I say that is that I'm so used to that speaker yep. and the high fidelity speakers would actually be wasted in the studio until we have floating floors and until we've got all sorts of different, I don't know, solutions to blocking out the rest of the, the, the noise that does still yeah, somehow make yeah. its way in. And for what I'm trying to mix and master, I don't think anybody would, would hear the difference. Do you want to tell everyone what monitors are in there? No, nah, they don't sponsor us yet. Um, oh, you know, this is just a generic... Uh, there's there's heaps of brands that people would often go to. So the, you've got the Yamaha NS10s, yeah. which I think are the world's worst sounding speakers. And yeah. you know, supposedly, if you can make a mix sound good on those, you hey, can. NS? NS10s? I got the HS8s. Yeah, I think it's NS10s. Oh, I can edit no. that out if I. Uh, no, 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 leave it. I'm just saying, I thought you dissing my, my monitors. I was like, dissing. I think my no, mix no, no, is all right, mate. Yeah, I, I think the story was that uh, really, really high cred. Mix engineer was using them as a reference or something, and then okay. all of a sudden that just became the standard. Um, I would love to upgrade to the generic, whatever. But again, this podcast isn't about gear, and maybe one day we will. But when you're dropping like fifty to eighty thousand dollars on speakers, I mean, the room needs to be at the level to support that anyway. Correct. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So you've got vocal recording, vocal recording, mix and mastering. That yeah. that's the bread and butter of that room. Production is a really difficult one for me in Adelaide. Mm-hmm. When I was with my publisher. There may have been opportunities for me to produce for certain people or to, you'd get like a pitch. So say a television ad needed a song that fitted this type of commercial or even if it wasn't a commercial, it could just be an artist was looking for a tropical beat or something. Yeah. You could pitch stuff and then either you could get a payout or you could get ongoing royalties and there was an exchange of money there. But yeah, that, I didn't have too much success in that world um, in recent times. But back in the day, yeah, had had quite some well had some good opportunities with synchronization. So, mm. are you familiar with sync? I, I understand the concept. I'm learning a bit more about it because I'm thinking it might be something that I'm trying to put a bit more time and effort into. So, so synchronization fees is where a company wants the right to use your music that has been synchronized to visual. Okay. So, uh, the Super Bowl is running a halftime ad, and they've got a really cool advertisement and your latest track, Hibachi, just happens to be perfect for that. Yep. They'll buy the exclusive worldwide rights to use that song at their discretion in that advert without needing to ask you every five seconds, hey, we're now going to run this on TikTok or we're going to do this or that. They just they have the rights for a certain amount of time to run that campaign and they pay handsomely for it. Like, seriously. So is, is it only paying handsomely because that would be the NFL? 
And so yeah, it the depends on the, the brand that is, yeah. 100% where you could get a micro sync fee from a very small brand that yeah. just like, hey, I'm doing this non-for-profit thing or yeah. I want to just know that I'm not getting flagged for copyright and I want to do this little okay. thing at school or something. And but aim for the big dogs. Aim for the big dogs. And that's all about, you've got to be relevant, you've got to have a trending track or you've got to know the right people. Mm. So don't aim for that straight away. But there's tons of platforms out there now that you can submit your music to. But the problem is that it's high competition. There's also a 10, 10 there's other producers doing the same thing. And I feel like there's probably websites out there as well that just have bucket loads of songs that anyone can pick up and choose. Yeah, it might not be the best quality. They may not suit what you need. But, you know, for someone who's looking for background music in their YouTube video or yeah. background music in whatever it might be, maybe that avenue for them is like simple and easy. Yeah. So I like the concept of making something once and then, you know, 10,000 sales or whatever. It's yeah. similar to Spotify. I don't know what the payout rates are like and I don't think they would be huge. But it's almost like if anybody knows what Shutterstock is, you're effectively just throwing something up there for someone to use. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think you want to be a little bit more about the rarity of your song. Yeah, I agree. I'll, I'll, I've never really had much luck with trying to put my beats on hip-hop. Yeah. I can't even remember the website. What is it? Beat Stars. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. you're just like a fish in an ocean and like some dude's putting coin to make his appear at the top and people have a reputation already. It's like it was very hard to get seen and I don't think that's a reflection of the beats. It's just that you can't, it's really, really hard to get noticed in that crowd. Absolutely agree. That's why I haven't done it. And mm. I tried Spotify. Oh, what was it called? Spotify had one. Really? Yeah, I've, I've totally gone blank on what it was called. But okay. essentially, you put your production rates up there and all the services you offer as a musician or a mix engineer or vocal engineer, whatever. Mm. Uh, I think I may have pulled my profile down now. But same thing. When you're trying to make money out of your music, it's hard if you're trying to make money, right? So. If you're a service provider, which I am now, so I do vocal, engineering, tuning, processing, everything from start to finish, right? Then I do mix and mastering and I do do some production, but like I was saying, it's kind of hard locally in Adelaide to, to do that. Uh, I, I like to go for the bigger projects. I also do podcasting, which yeah. is why we have this set up. So there, that's me being a service provider. Yeah. If we're talking about how to make money as an artist, then... I think you've got to find avenues where it's offering immediate value to your audience. Mm. And yeah, obviously the larger the audience, the scalable your income. But at the start, you almost want to just keep it really simple. Yeah. So for you and I, even at the point in our career now, throwing events would be really cool for that handful of people that are in Adelaide that would really like to get amongst us and hang out. So like more of an educational event or are you talking about like a show or... Well... This podcast is catering to two audiences. One is the educational side of people that are interested because they're hoping to take something away from this and apply it to their life. The other is just interested and fascinated, but they're a fan of the music and probably not so interested in yeah. the technicality. Just yeah. want to know what's what going on. What mic we use. Yeah. So you'd have to pick. So you'd have to you'd have to go, right, we can do an educational thing here at the studio where we have a handful of people and we teach mm. some stuff. Or we go, no, let's just go throw down a banger set somewhere. And we'll charge 10 bucks entry. Yeah. And that's a way to create revenue. But yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Once you figure out where the value is and what you can offer, then you can scale it like any business. Did you have any luck with sample packs? Huge success with sample packs. Is that the ones just through Splice or independently or? Uh, so I guess independently, I know more about the, the success of that. So Luke and I, when we first started Global League, we wanted to figure out how to raise capital to invest back into the company. So like our merch drops and sample packs, that that was all way to create revenue for the business. So sample packs is great because I think the uh, the ease of someone going online being like, oh, I really want to play that video and then just clicking on the website, downloading the whole sample pack and getting it. Mm. Happy days. So yeah, that's, that's basically what helped, helped keep Global League afloat. If you've got an audience that are really hungry for your songs because they're producers as well, Great way to make some cash is to do sample packs. Mm. Yeah. What do yes. you think about it? Yeah, it's one of those ideas I had, but I exported seven samples and then gave up. I think it's a bit more like I, I look, I'll, I'll be honest, this conversation really fascinates me too, because I think my focus for the meantime, for the short term slash long term, is going to be how can I 
try and maximize my my income through music because it's it's becoming really important where I am in life that I make sure I do so. Yep. So something like a sample pack to me is interesting, but you know, it's only 10 bucks a pop. My reach production wise, probably not substantial enough to think, oh, well, I'm going to make a check out of that that's going to make a difference. You know what I mean? Like I might sell 10, 20, whatever. Yeah. Better than nothing. And like you said, a lot of the money we earn as artists just goes back into the cost of being an artist. So the 200 bucks I might make off my sample pack will probably just pay for a, you know, a, v- a video down the track as well. So I'm not trying to make profit, but you know, it's trying to just maximize as much as I can. It's hard. You got to be a bit patient because you know, I'm thinking, well, I don't want to earn $10. I want to earn $100 on yeah. a pop, but you got to figure out how, you, how to do that. It's a, it's a bit daunting. So that's why, you know, a sync fee to me is obviously much more appealing, but it's a lot, also a lot more difficult. Sure. So we're going to treat it like a business. Yeah. And I think the best in the game that are, are doing the best or seemingly have the most success are actually businessmen. Yeah. They're still talented, but I think they're businessmen. So you've got to treat it. Um, you're almost going to be binary. You've got to be really, uh, you've got to have tactics applied to having, we've talked about this before so many times, objectives. And, yeah. And goal setting, but objectives. Like what, what do you even need to make a year to, for it to be substantial enough to say, I, you know, I'm full-time making money from music. So, the maths is really simple. If you can have a thousand super fans, now super fans are different to just followers. Super fans are the ones that you respond to on direct message and, you know, very, very keen. They're always wanting to know what you're doing. They're almost like friends. Yep. A thousand super fans, to make a hundred dollars from them a year shouldn't be difficult. Shouldn't be. If you say, okay, I sold one hoodie for 50 or 60 dollars, actually, hoodies are pretty expensive. You can sell hoodies for like 90. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're expensive. Yeah. Well, with everything, inflation at the moment. Whew. Okay, so let's say one ticket to a show for 10 to $20, one hoodie, and maybe they've been streaming your music that year or they sub to your YouTube and they've been part of the process of that passive income. Mm-hmm. You could be able to make $100 from 1,000 people, but you've got to nurture that 1,000 people. And I think the biggest mistake artists make, and I'm definitely one of them, and I would love to be more engaged with the community, is that I don't nurture the community in a way or consistent way that I'm paying it forward enough that I don't even need to ask. I don't even need Mm. to, whatever. And so I think we all aspire to, you know, benefit our community with our music. But I think that's 10% of the equation. I think the remaining 90% is they need to know what your your life's about, why you make music, how is it, how are you relevant to them? How can you communicate with them? And we're in the most connected time we've ever been in, which can actually work against us. Yeah, I was about to say, it's changed. You know, before it used to be just you put out music and that's it and people fall in love with this enigma of an artist that they don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, like you said, the the 10% is the music, the 90% is your lifestyle. What, how, how are you sharing your life with me so I feel like we're together? Correct. And that's come from all that short form content. Mm. Uh, so, you know, your TikToks are doing really, really well right now because it's just a quick, easy fix. I think we've fallen victim to that very fast dopamine that's released when people do get a notification or they do see something funny or interesting on TikTok and they become addicted to that. The longevity in that though is that what I've noticed is the artists that I know that are doing well on TikTok, when they have a call to action, like come to my show or buy some merch or whatever on TikTok, people aren't engaging because that's not what they're on the platform for. Exactly. It's a different medium when it comes to what's on TikTok and like, you know, real life attending music clubs, yeah. you know, getting people out of the house. They're two different things. That's an entertainment hit. You know, it's not it's not a call that people are going to answer to buy a ticket to a show. Totally. And I, I like what you said, commitment. Mm. You know, this for our listeners and watchers, this is a commitment now. You know, we started with little short, shorter videos that were like yep. 20 minutes just to, I wanted to test, you know, people are actually going to enjoy this. And the recurring message was, we, need, we want longer. So here's a longer version, but this is not just, oh yeah, I'll, I'll quickly play this before I go to work or go to the gym mm. or whatever I'm doing in life that's going <laughs> to take me away from this. Like, no, I'm going to set aside some time to sit down, watch the lads have a chat, see what they're up to and hope that you guys get such a valuable insight into what we're doing and all the problems we have, but also all the wins that we have Mm. that you feel like you can accomplish that too because I'm going to be real straight with everyone right now. What we're doing, everybody can do. 
like I did not plan to have a recording studio and be full-time music. I was meant to be an architect. And I didn't plan to be a YouTube viral sensation. (laughs) (laughs) However many years ago that was, that was a really, really, really happy, lucky accident Mm. that then took a, a totally, my life went on a totally different direction that it's taught me so much. And I've only just sort of finished the, I think the first phase of research and development. So getting back to how to make money, have you got any other thoughts? We've talked about merch, we've talked about streaming, which is pitiful. Yeah. We've talked about being a service provider. What are some other ways? Uh, I, I think we've covered quite a lot, to be honest, at least from my notes, what I've seen. I mean, the other thing too is it's the holistic approach too. You might find that, you know, you, you took a sample of a cat meowing on TikTok and you remix that and all of a sudden you're getting brand endorsement deals because... That's a good one, actually. Sponsorship. Sponsorship. And that normally falls into place when you are seen to be doing something massive. And I think the best advice I can give about brand deals is you you really do need to know your worth. And, and so often, I think the first time you get a deal offered to you, you have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. How do you rank... You get one deal, you're probably over the moon. Yeah but you could be worth more than you realize. Absolutely. So knowledge is power. And to know what your brand is worth, there are plenty of people out there that specialize in that, but they take a cut. Yeah. So, you know, they, they can negotiate the deal for you, but they generally take 10, 15, 20%. Mm-hmm. I think that also falls into part when you have a manager or record label or music publisher. Anytime someone owns you or your intellectual property, they can possibly negotiate a higher fee. When it's you versus you in the negotiations, it's mm-hmm. it's very difficult. So these are all the things that you will learn as you go through your journey as an artist. You, you suddenly realize that you have to put this quantitative value on a qualitative product. Like mm-hmm. it's it's fascinating looking back now to think, oh, yeah, I probably took myself out of a really big deal there just because I was so happy to have the exposure. Exposure is another one. That's not a thing. Well, you were talking that I what popped up to my head was that when you were talking about the going on a festival lineup for no no cost, well, yep. that's kind of like, oh, we'll pay you in promotion or we'll pay you in exposure. And, you know, like I've got an opinion of that. I think intrinsically, I would love to throw down on a festival for free. And I've done it before. I talked about it on one of the episodes. Like I've done it because my passion outweighed any monetary gain on that. Yeah. I mean, how cool. Honestly, to to have the privilege to play your music and perform on a stage in front of 10,000 people, 20,000 people, 50,000 people, who knows? Awesome. If you get your flights and your accommodation and some food out of it, so if you, especially if it's not in your home state, I mean, that's cool as. Mm. Ultimately though, you know, as you do become more relevant and you, you have more value to offer, you need to weigh up the cost that it's costing you financially to, to go off and do those things. You can't do it forever. Well, because I, yeah, I feel like a lot of people don't realize that like, for the artist to get to that show, they got to buy that flight. They got to taxi that. They got to yeah. bank, make that Uber. They got to feed themselves. Like the that should be covered. It should be, but I know that like we were talking about some people touring recently into to Europe and that, and it's yep. like it's an expense though. Yeah, that's the that's the problem. If you are traveling the other side of the world and you have a show on a Saturday night and your next show isn't till the following, who fits the bill for the remaining six days? right? And the transit. So often, and this is why I I have so much respect for bands. Bands normally lose or break money on on tour. They don't make money. And that's generally because there's five mouths to feed. You've got to find a a van to transport the gear. There's repairs constantly on tour for people that travel with equipment. There's often a tour manager that needs to be paid or someone to help with logistics and all that sort of stuff. It's, It's full on. And so anybody that's done tour life, like I've done tour life as a DJ with other DJs and that was that was hectic enough. I hate to think what it would be like, you know, as a band. Yeah, with guitars and drums in the back. Yeah. I mean, I've traveled with launch pads and had to take spares and had laptop failures and yeah. launch pads break down on me and all sorts of stuff. But that's that's fine. You can fix that when you've got a vintage guitar or something. Yeah. <laughs> or your, vo- your voice. Imagine if you, you know, at least it's just... Uh, Hit play, right? <laughs> well, that's what I mean. I feel like so Sometimes lucky when I play a play a gig. It's all I have is a backpack with headphones and a US two USBs. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, look. So to get to the point where you are making money from music, you've uh, you've got to establish the value that you're willing to offer, and then yeah, I mean, money is obviously just an exchange of value. So 
yeah, I think you need to work out some objectives. And sometimes those objectives are actually nothing to do with money. Mm. And money can be the byproduct of the success of just offering really good value. But, you know, reach out to us. If, if you're like, look, I'm a bedroom producer or, you know, we could have photographers or videographers or anyone in the creative field that just like, how do you even get started? Yeah. Yeah, you need to, you need to collaborate probably is, is number one. Yeah, well, that's definitely true because it didn't start for me until I started coming here and meeting you guys and that, you know, it all trickles together. And it, it started for me out of an opportunity, out of a risk. So yeah, not a lot of it was planned. And now it's planned. I'm like, okay, how do I make this like epic? Well, it's happening, man. It's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do a lot more um, gratitude. So I'm trying to live a little bit more in the moment because I have crazy anxiety. Like I'm always freaking out about mm-hmm. where's the next dollar coming from? How much is this costing me? Yeah. Um, what's the future looking like? Should I have done something differently in the past? That doesn't help. And if I can just like live in the moment, like today is cool as like I worked on this really awesome project prior to you rocking up and us recording this. Clients of mine who are now friends of mine, they have released one podcast episode and it's in the top 10 in Australia. That's so crazy. Good on them. Look them up. Use your manners. Shout out to Leah and Mitch. Unreal. It's an absolute joy to be a part of their projects. Like I actually genuinely love the whole, you know, from when they rock up to recording to the post-production, the editing, getting it out to the world, like that's cool. But I had no idea that I was going to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I've just, I don't know, podcasting kind of fits into everything that I'm doing in my approach. Why not offer that to everybody else? It's a good, as a business and that's as a service provider, great yeah. avenue to be in. Yeah, not a lot of that happening in Adelaide. No. And I mean, yeah, kudos to them and to you. You're going to be able to boast that you produce a top, I reckon, five, maybe two. Going for number one. I reckon <laughs> it's possible, man. At least some weeks you'll probably, you probably, after a few, if they have a couple big guests on There's one week. seriously massive podcasts in that list. Do you know who's number one or two or five? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, no, I say yes. And Does the complain. internationals count or is Correct. it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Gonna it's, be it's, the, it's the world of podcasters. All oh, right. Yeah. But what's like trending in Australia. They're in the right, top 10. Right, right. Well, top five. I reckon they can do it. Top five. So you're going to be able to boast that. That's awesome, man. To go number one would be pretty huge. Yeah. Um, so that's, okay, that's how to make money. And again, reach out to us. We can give you some tips after this podcast episode. Ways in which not to spend money. That's a good one. Ways to save money, I guess, as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't save money. I, I spend every dollar I earn. Yes. Every single dollar. I do believe that. Yeah. You just have to walk into this Seen place. It. So, Chief and I were talking off camera before because we know plenty of artists that just blow cash. And we're not talking just like Rolexes and fancy cars. We're talking about like stupid ways to spend money that's, thinking you'd make more. That's Well, it's just about spending money in the wrong ways. You should invest into yourself. Do you want to take a drink? I'm thirsty. No, but I have something good to say. You should invest money into yourself, your brand, your project and that. But just the way you go about it, you got to be smarter than buying pairs of shoes because you think it's going to make a difference. That someone sees you in red shoes compared to (laughs) whatever else. So, well, it could be anyone. They're all... Well, it's it's not not unique. It's pretty common, isn't it? Well, that's what I mean. I've got it on the list. Image. It's a two-way street because it is important that the way you, like your brand is received reflects the lifestyle and stuff you want to mm-hmm. give people that image to perceive. So I understand it, but the reality of it is that you're not really, it's the return on investment in you buying thousands of dollars worth of outfits if is not, it's not good. Yeah. You're not going to get any sort of redemption in any monetary value because you look cool. So what are you saying? Fake it till you make it isn't a thing? Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. It, it's a fine line because you do want to look like, uh, I don't know, that's the thing about the rap game and the hip hop game is that people oh, want to, no, that's hilarious. like image is huge though. It makes, I, I, I understand. Like how many, there's not many rappers you see out there that wear baggy jeans and like a white tee. You know what I mean? Like everyone's in this like crisp, crisp jacket and like with these like $3,000 slides and like chains. Yeah, like jewelry. a Louis V fucking little Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, what are they called? The little satchels type of thing? The bum bags. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You yeah. know what I mean? So I, I understand but that's what I mean. We're talking with what? Two 30-year-old guys being like 
oh, trying, yeah. trying to coach people on what they should wear. But hey, I'm pretty sure like, you know, Bill Gates and that just wears the same shirt and uh, T-shirt. So I've got friends that are pretty, pretty wealthy. They don't wear brands. And if they wear a brand, it's usually their own. So it's their merch, their company, their business or whatever, or their artist merch, whatever. Uh, the rest of the time they're wearing, yeah, something that doesn't have any brand association. Uh, that, but again, that's, this is vanity. Like if, if we're talking about money that you could, you could spend wrongly, here's my hot tips for 2023. Don't hit up aggregators, playlists, curators, all that and spend money on on that and don't sponsor posts and don't boost posts yeah. and whatever unless you have some sort of understanding and background in digital marketing. Also, don't get swept into the thought that you can just pay someone to do it for you and you're going to see results. Ultimately, you need to start small, keep it simple and once you can clearly identify where ad spend because a lot of people are spending money on advertising thinking that, oh, there's X and billion amount of people on Facebook. Therefore, if I just target these people and these people, it's going to work. Yeah, in theory, but not really. Because again, it all comes down to value and how are you meant to get anyone's attention right now? I just find that a lot of the results from those ad campaigns and boosted posts are just empty, shallow stats. Yeah, that's right. You could have a massive fan, fan base, but they're not, they're not engaging. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I say this every week on this episode of the podcast, objectives. What's your objective? Do you want a vanity metric? which a lot of our artists, like when I've really grilled them, that's ultimately what they want. They just want the vanity of, I want to look good, whether it's physically in the real world or on social media. If you want 100,000 plays on your reels, you can, play, you can pay people to get that, whether mm. it's click farm bullshit, whether it's just, you know, getting viral for the sake of getting viral. You can do that. But what's the, what's the point? Well, that's what, it took me a bit of trial to learn that. I tried getting someone to put me in Spotify playlists. I tried... SoundCloud playlists back, especially back when they were a bit more relevant. Yeah. Um, I did boosted posts. I did ads. I did all of it. Yep. And then I came to understand that I got nothing out of it of any value towards me. Even the numbers. I don't, I'm not a numbers guy, so I didn't really, I would, I, I would want one genuine follower over a thousand fake views any day of the week. Yeah. So when I was getting all these bullshit followers and people that wouldn't engage with the post after that point, they're, they're like meaningless to me. Yeah. And getting views on anything is, if they're not really engaging with the content, that might like swiping across counts as a view or like three seconds, I think maybe. It's, it's, it's just not genuine enough for me to be like, yeah, I don't care about the numbers, so I'm not going to put my money behind it. There you go. So the takeaway from that is if you can identify why you would want to boost something, you gotta, what's the takeaway? I feel like the only way you might justify it now is that you're just trying to get seen by as many people as you can, but you don't value if they actually engage with the content at all. You're just like trying to, like, you know, I'm sure when, you know, all those random businesses, you know, like, who you know, TikTok, fucking, it could be like Colgate, I don't know. When you see the Colgate, you just swipe past them, but they're just getting into your subconscious. They're making sure that they're still living there. Yeah, that's right. If you're trying to do that, I can understand it. But for yeah. a low-key artist who no one knows, like, well, No, I think we're all just a bit desperate. Well, mm. when I say we, I'm trying not to be one of those people. I haven't played the content game and I know that's to the detriment of my brand. Like, I was only getting a reminder this morning from Luke. It was nighttime in New York and morning for us. And he's like, hey, man, this would be a great time for you to share a reel. And I'm like, at this point in time, I am stressing about data reconciliation where I'm trying to move four terabytes of video to another hard drive and I'm freaking out that it's taking two hours. Posting a reel would have been a great way to... Takes two seconds? Yeah. But I just, for some reason, I don't know if anybody else out there feels the same. I have like tunnel vision. Yeah. I do one task really, really well at the time that I want to do it, not because I need to do it, just because I want to do it, right? Yeah. Like I have such a backlog of stuff that I need to do. Like the amount of episodes we put out and I haven't been sharing reels and all that sort of stuff. Also, like what's my objective? Well, at the moment, it's kind of to nurture YouTube and to build a new audience on Spotify. That's my objective. I'm trying to pay it forward. This podcast is completely funded by me, right? There's no pay for this. Like it's free. And I'm totally happy with that. Mm. Like, 
I'm privileged to be able to do this. Let's just fucking do it. Let's go. Let's hope it adds some benefit. That's my objective. Trying to get people to listen to my next song. Whilst that's a really important thing, that's not my key objective right now. Mm. I'm putting out music for the sake of putting out music and loving taking that step back and just being like, nope, I'm building a catalog that when the time is right, if people do want to listen to it, there's going to be 36 songs out there. Like this week, I'm so behind. I'm meant to have the next song ready for Global League to, to put out and I just... Time to bring out the whip, crack the whip. Well, on I'm almost to the point where the business probably needs to have some more help, more people yeah. on board. But uh, with that, I, you know, that's added complications where if I just smash out this last little bit of, of work and then I've got the system ready to onboard people and then, then we're good to go. Yeah, I think you will find the balance soon. Yeah. You just need to... There's bigger things on your mind, which I completely understand, which is this business and making sure it's working. And then you can post real. It's super exciting that the business is at a point now where it is working and I do have the opportunity to probably bid like, okay, you, you sit here, do this task, blah, blah, blah. I step mm. out. Happy mm. days. So that's a pretty cool, cool spot to be in. Also yeah. Terrifying. For sure. It's a big step. Yeah. Um, well, that won't be bad use of your money though. No, 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 that will help tenfold. Um, so, okay. So yeah, spending money, uh, what other ways can you, can you blow cash? Well, a good one for me is unnes- like that I see people do that I always think is silly is just buying unnecessary gear. Yeah, we know of someone who has gone out and bought mics that are for studios to use at home. And uh, has also bought every plugin under the sun and every additional bit of software you could possibly want for Ableton more than I have, more than I own. Yeah. And for what? Well, that's what I mean. People are just trying to replicate the experience of coming to a studio, but you, it's its its whole career in itself. It's something that these people have studied, the rooms are designed for. You're not going to replicate that by just buying product. One thing that irks me, but I also need to like, remove my ego is when I have clients tell me, oh, have you tried this? <laughs> so I'll be working on a vocal and they're like, oh, just chuck this plug in on it. Like it's got AI and it will just sort everything. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, could. And often do just to appease them and whatever. And I learn something from it. But ultimately it's like, nah, it's not. It's just throwing plugins, expensive plugins on a vocal doesn't make a, 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 what is the saying? Like a polished turd is still shit. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. You can't polish turd. Thank you. I thought I'd just come up with something. Yeah. Well, you might have. So, yeah, I, I, if, uh, if, anyone's out start, like, if anyone out there is starting on Ableton, you don't need to buy, you know, the entire platinum bundle of waves or get the full contact. Well, whatever. you don't even need sweet. I don't have sweet. Neither I do I. I started on sweet. I've never had it in my life. Yeah. Actually, that's going to be exciting uh, in the coming weeks. I'm not sure when I've gone blank but we'll talk about it closer to the event. We're hosting an Ableton event here. They're coming. They're coming. We're going to... Give me my keys, please. We're going to... Sweet <laughs> keys, please. We're going to be demoing <laughs> the next model of the Ableton push. Fuck yeah. That's yeah, awesome. We can get some new faces into the building as well. Yeah, that's it. Um, but yeah, getting back to gear. Yeah, people often think that the, the more expensive the gear, the better the quality products. Not necessarily... You need to know how to use it at least. I think, you know, a concept I take towards my life, not just, you know, musical equipment or anything. Buy the cheap version first. Yes. See how much you use it. Yep. See if you enjoy it. Yep. See what quality you get out of it. If you then realize you need the better one, go spend that cash because you've justified the purchase at that point. Yep. But if you go out and buy the $500 thing straight from the bat and it sits on your shelf and collects dust, well, you made a mistake. Really interesting. Even like the mics we're recording on right now, I didn't adapt quick enough because I probably didn't know how to use them. And that's not, that's just a naivety on my part. I was like, oh, better quality mic will sound better. Uh, we were using the version of mic that comes with the, the kit that I bought. Yeah. And they were quite high end and very clear. Yeah. Massive issues though. Massive issues that I didn't realize until we moved up in grade yeah, to these, yeah. these mics. They had massive issues in picking up all this other sound and um, yeah, whatever. We get these mics and I noticed that the, the first few episodes we did where I wasn't really paying much attention because I think I was just like trying to get these episodes out timely, really booming. Yeah. So you could have a really, really good quality mic and still stuff up the audio. Yeah, you need to treat it. You know, that's, what I'm, that's what we're talking about. You need to be educated in your purchases. Yeah. You still need to put the effort in. It's just not going to, it's not a band-aid to fix all your problems. Oh, actually another one I wanted to mention 
which is a waste of money. Yeah. And my videographer, photographer friend's going to hate me for saying this. Spending heaps of money on a music video clip to your f- oh, 10 followers yeah. or your… If, if you've got a couple of thousand followers on Instagram, like, cool. But spending thousands of dollars to make a video clip that they probably won't watch is a waste. What I would encourage you to do is to film the process of making your own music video clip so people are kind of interested in it and, and just get get quirky with it and, and record on an iPhone, not a cinema camera. Yeah, it's just not uh, necessary really. I guess we're t- we take a very mature re- approach to all of this, I think as… Realistic approach. Yeah, because we, well, I think we're a bit, maybe a bit older than the people we're talking about as well. So we right. understand that like, you know, throwing around two, five grand on these things where… I don't know, I said it before, the return on investment, it, to me, is what I'm always thinking about, right? Yeah. So I know if I go and purchase uh, like a Cinema 4D or a Blender video, I won't actually get money back, but I know the content will be good. It will get viewed. I don't pay too much for it, but it's worth the investment, right? If I were to say I want to go shoot a massive three-minute film clip, which wouldn't even, I would not be in that, I, to put on YouTube, I just know that for the two thousand to five thousand dollars it cost, I'm not going to get the amount of plays to make up for that investment. You know, no, totally. And so I think you're right when if you're looking at ways to promote your music and that. Well, I mean, we're not going to go through it now, but it's all short form videos behind the scenes, more personality reflecting stuff. I think the day of the music video is a bit dead unless you're a really big player. I think it's definitely on its way out. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's just my opinion, but I, you know. Let the major label spend all their money on your music video clip. Exactly, Don't exactly. you spend your money on it. Um, yeah. I've wanted to ask you this. I'm seeing so many of these videos. On TikTok especially, an artist will mime, like a vocalist yeah. will mime to one of their songs as a way of promoing, Yeah, right? But mm. it's so, <laughs> to me, so obviously mimed so hideously out of time. The <laughs> facial expressions, just everything to do with it just seems so out yeah. of touch. So go back to what Luke said last week. You're the creator, not the consumer, and that's why you see it in that way. So am I just an asshole or are these just shit videos? You're a creator, not a consumer. You're <laughs> thinking about it where people are just watching. Oh, man. You know what I mean? Like, But we notice that stuff. I notice when things are out of sync. Like... Or laggy and that, like, you know, I might be watching something streamed with my girlfriend and she doesn't notice that there's a 0.5 mil of sound difference. But we do. We're tuned that way. Right. Um, You're just looking at it with a different lens than other people. I think even other people might understand that it's mimed or fake. Um, They might, might not care. I just feel like why, if you've got the opportunity to showcase your talent, show the rawness and authenticity of it. So I would applaud anyone in a vocalist or an instrumentalist or even a producer that is not faking it and just even I, like, oh, I guess you're not faking it, but it's very obvious that as you were walking through a park, you weren't singing to your song. Oh, you I were, love that shit. Or like they'll be sitting in their big room with a mic that's probably not even plugged in, just sitting in the middle of an untreated air. Like, you know, you're like, this doesn't add up. <laughs> you go to a done. lot of effort there with your oh. microphone that's not plugged oh, yeah. in. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. So, yeah, but it's that's the visual of it. Yeah, you just see it in that lens. I bet if you did it's hard, that type of content doesn't exactly relate to us, but you know, if we pretended to press play on the decks and went behind the, like this, it's like know, me doing a fake launch pad thing. Yeah, yeah, but your integrity says no, and you're you're a bit different because you're built on it being legit. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, all I want to say is before we wrap up completely is when um, we're not trying to shit on people. No, this is like caring advice. Yeah, and I, I hope no one feels targeted in the way we talk. Like I said, we're just. If you two, do, then you need to learn something. We're just two <laughs> older guys trying to save young people from spending their money in shitty ways. That's yeah. All. Think of when you get old. You it's funny though because I've given this advice to so many people and they don't take it, and it comes full circle. They'll come back to me like, "Yeah, can't afford to do anything in the studio at the moment. Like, just spent way too much on this thing that didn't pay oh. off for me, or like I signed this shitty deal." Or like I just sank all this money into this video and I want to see my investment return. Like, bow, bow. Yeah, well, it takes lessons to learn and we've just done that. So now we know. Oh, yeah. I mean, part of the advice we're giving is because we've done it. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to save it. So please don't take anything personally. Yeah. Anyway, shorter episode this time because Luke is in New York. He'll be back next week where we're probably going to try and plan some guests as well. Yeah, we need to definitely do that. Yeah. So every week. So. And I was also going to bring the launch pad out. I've done something to my wrist. Oh, no. Yeah. A money maker. It's, I don't know. A couple of weeks now. I'm sure we get it looked at. Um, but do do want to get the launch pads out and do some freestyle stuff and, and maybe go a little bit more in depth into how I build my projects. Yeah. Have a bit of fun. Sounds good. Anyway, thank you for listening or watching. If you've enjoyed this episode or if you uh, didn't enjoy this episode, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week. Ciao.